So I'm Ron Baghetto. I recently joined the faculty here at the University of Connecticut in January of 2014. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Connecticut, I was at the University of Oregon for 11 years. And today I just want to speak briefly about some of the key ideas in my recent book, Killing Ideas Softly, and really speak to educators, educational leaders, and teachers around some of these ideas. And so I think one of the driving ideas that I try to communicate in that book is that if we want to incorporate creativity in schools and classrooms, it doesn't require making radical changes. It really requires making slight adjustments to what we're already doing. And one of the things that is probably the most useful to do is to really think about our own practices and kind of the practices we inherit from our own prior schooling experiences and how that can sometimes inadvertently suppress our own and our students' creativity in the classroom. And so that's where the idea of killing ideas softly comes in. I've never met a teacher who overtly wants to squash students' ideas. Typically it happens inadvertently when a student says something that's unexpected or unusual and we as educators have our eyes focused on an instructional objective and we fail to see the potential creativity in that unexpected idea. And so I think what happens in school often the times, what we're looking for is a response in the way we want to hear it and how we want to hear it. And so anything that becomes unexpected, we softly dismiss by saying things such as, we'll return to that idea, that's very creative, but I don't understand how it fits in what we're talking about, why don't you think about that some more, and so on. As a result, we miss these what I call micro-moment opportunities where a student might share something that seems unusual on the surface, but through exploration might really be generative and not only express their understanding and help them develop their own understanding, but influence the understanding of their peers and also of teachers. And so this book really focuses on how can you recognize these moments of creative opportunity? What do you do when they arise? And I have a couple of little sayings such as, you know, explore first, then evaluate. I think one of the things we often do when we ask a question in school, as many researchers before have described, is we ask known answer questions, which is a very unusual thing to ask in the classroom. We already have a predetermined answer in mind and also the way we want to hear it. And so what I'd like us to do is, is when we ask a question, be okay with an unexpected response and just take a moment or two and explore that response to see what might be underneath it. Now it's true that some kids might be confused, there may be a few that are willfully trying to disrupt the class, but oftentimes students are genuinely putting forth their ideas and, it's, and we want to honor those and actually explore what those ideas are. The other component that I think is really important um, is a concept that I call creative mortification. Now this concept um, really pertains to the feedback we give to students and it's often a throwaway feedback moment but it's how it's received and experienced by students that could be really devastating. So creative mortification refers to a student who has a creative aspiration so maybe a kid wants to be a dancer or an artist or wants to pursue some creative outlet in sports or even in academics and so as the students developing their identity in this particular creative domain they're getting feedback over time that they're making progress, they're starting to see themselves as you know, an aspiring poet, for example. And then sometimes what happens is they receive almost in an offhand comment feedback, a negative feedback on a performance that they've had, and they stop pursuing that aspiration. And so what dies in that moment is not creativity, because creativity is something, as long as we're alive, it's something that is always with us. But what dies in that moment is the will to create, the willingness to pursue that idea. And so many of you might have experienced this in your own lives, or you've seen it in other people's lives, where somebody has a creative aspiration, they have a negative performance outcome, they receive feedback in a split second, and they never pursue that career again. The poet sets the pin down, never to pick it up, the dancer hangs up the shoes, and so on. And what this often happens is with parents, teachers, and coaches providing feedback um, that's received in such a way that the student feels shamed in that moment, the student feels like they can't get better, and so that there's no um, desire then to kind of relive that shaming experience, and also the belief that they couldn't get better anyway. So the question is, do we not give honest feedback to students? And that is not what I'm saying. Because the other interesting thing about this is somebody could have an equally negative performance outcome yet still pursue their creative aspirations. So what's the difference? 
The difference is that the student believes improvement's possible and that they're not shamed in that moment. They might feel a little bit um, hurt in that moment, but they still realize that I can get better at this. And so what we can do as parents, teachers, coaches, is when we're providing honest feedback, which I believe we should provide, we should couple that with a message, kind of like what Carol Dwick talks about, that improvement is possible. And we want to make sure that students understand, although I'm not here, here's how I can improve. And so in that way, that we're not losing all these kind of wonderful opportunities for creative growth and development.